Welcome to Connect, the monthly series to connect you with your community. In each episode, we speak with experts, innovators, and community members, and together explore themes of loneliness, social connections, and healthy aging across Massachusetts. I'm your host, Sandra Harris, the state president for AARP Massachusetts and co-chair of the task force to end loneliness and build community. As we better understand how the loneliness epidemic is impacting our communities, we are learning that it is non-discriminate and can affect more than the usual suspects, older adults living alone. Research tells us that 36% of all Americans feel serious loneliness, including 61% of young people between the ages of 18 and 25. One group that may be particularly susceptible to loneliness and burnout is caregivers. To explore this theme further, with me today is Brenda Labby, the Out Community Outreach Director at Greater Springfield Senior Services. Welcome, Brenda, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today and being able to share this time with you. Good. Uh, Brenda, can you please start by sharing your story? What do you do as the Community Outreach Director? And how does this work intersect with caregiving? Sure. So as the Community Outreach Director, myself and my team at Greater Springfield Senior Services, we are the experts in learning where the community resources are for caregivers and older adults um, and the persons that care for them. And we do this by going out into the community to meet with businesses, to meet with our community partners, um, and we, we uh, filter and find the resources and supports. Oftentimes when we're networking with our community partners, we're learning the eligibility criteria for the programs and the demographic that they serve. And what we do is then we matchmake as we work with older adults and their family caregivers, and that's where it intersects, is that oftentimes as we're helping an older adult find the services and supports that they might need, the family caregiver is that intricate piece to that puzzle. They are there. And so we are there to support them and we connect them to the resources based on their needs. Oh, wonderful. Uh, oftentimes people who are providing care do not identify as caregivers. So can you please describe caregiving who is a caregiver? Sure, great question. So caregiving itself is being able to help um, an individual. It could be with some social isolation. Um, it could be you know, stopping in to check in on them. Maybe it's balancing a checkbook. Maybe it's making sure that they get their groceries, that they're getting their medicines. It can be all those acts that help an older adult remain, or a person with disabilities, remain living in the community. And it's, it's such an interwoven um, relationship that the caregiver is providing to that older adult. They are, it's very symbiotic. And who that caregiver is is oftentimes somebody that's in their life. It could be a spouse, it could be partner, um, daughters, sons, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers, and I would be remiss if I didn't also say, you know, grandparents that are raising grandchildren are also, um, you know, a demographic that we serve. Okay. Why are caregivers at such high risk for loneliness and social isolation? Another great question. Um, one of the reasons why they're at greater risk is they're, quite honestly, it's the, the number of tasks that they find themselves doing. Um, and every caregiver's journey begins differently. Every caregiver's journey has a different duration. And anywhere in that journey, um, typically for most folks, they may have started out caring for, let's say as a daughter is caring for a mother or her father, um, just checking in on them once or twice a week. Perhaps as time goes on, um, she finds herself caring more and more for the parents with more tasks, taking them to medical appointments, picking up those prescriptions, and now putting them into a pill box to make sure that they're taking them correctly. So the tasks start to pile up on the caregiver. They may also be sandwiched between generations. So they may also have their professional work career or they have and or they have their, their own families with children um, and partners and spouses. And so they're finding themselves 
um, kind of sort of squeezed on both sides. And as the number of tasks increase for the person that they're caring for, it can lead to stress, it can, uh, higher stress. It can lead to um, feeling more socially isolated because they feel that they're the only ones that are doing this. Um, their world starts to feel a little shrunken. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, as, as a long-term caregiver myself, I know too well the feeling of caregiving burnt out. Um, what advice do you have for us caregivers? How do we take care of ourselves? Uh, I will share, you know, myself even as a, as a caregiver myself, um, for my family members, I've had to learn this and it's something that um, you don't just learn once, um, you keep trying to learn it in your journey. Uh, how to care for yourself? Quite simply, I, my approach is, it's the simple things that mean the most. It's the simple, um, the simplicity of taking care of yourself with something as easy as giving yourself five minutes to listen to your favorite music each day. Mm. It could be having 15 minutes to take a walk around the neighborhood to clear my head or for a caregiver to clear their head. And so by having those small opportunities, you start to weave what I call a quilt of care for yourself and for your loved one because to be present and to be the best caregiver that you know a person wants to be for the person that they're caring for, their loved one, you have to care for yourself first. Um, and not that it's a priority. Um, I'm not suggesting that a caregiver must be the priority. It's actually a balance. So giving mm. yourself five minutes today to take a walk and smell the blossoming flowers on the trees because it's springtime, to maybe having you know 15 minutes for yourself to um, go for that walk around the neighborhood. It can make a world of difference for a caregiver to come back to their caregiving situation and then be more present. Another tip I would love to share with you, and, and honestly I'll even, it, it comes from my own personal experience. Um, I have two brothers that don't live close to me. And so when, I, when my brothers will ask me, what can we do to help, how can we help you? I would never have an answer for that and therefore it went unanswered and I continued to feel that I wasn't being supported. So in reflecting on that, I realized that one of the simplest ways for me to remember was to make a list. So I started to keep a list when it would come to my, you know, to my memory, when it would pop into my head um, that I could use help with, let's say, um, checking in on my mother and father's cable bill. That's uh, something that my brother can do from long distance. Um, my brother would say to me, I'm coming down for the weekend to visit with mom and dad. What can I do? I went to my list. And my list will include something that you know, I might want to do for five minutes, I might want to do for 15 minutes, something I would do with a half a day, something I would do with a whole day, and something I would do for a whole week. So those five things I keep on a list. And I post it on my refrigerator, I often encourage caregivers to put that on their refrigerator, their cabinet door, and use that, reflect on it. Because being so task laden, when a caregiver is finally offered that opportunity, we freeze. We forget, oh. what, what, it, what was it that I would do? And so to have that list to reflect back on makes it easier for folks to, you know, to take the offer that's being given to them and use it. Take it full advantage if my brother says he's coming down for the weekend, now I have a list of honeydew items to give him that he can follow and that he can help me with. Um, another tip that I would love to share would be you know, for a caregiver to um, consider in today's world the technology that's also available, available to them to use um, electronic, for example, Sign Up Genius is an application that can be used either on a desktop computer or even on an iPad. And you can create a free account and you can create a list and email it out to uh. individuals. So it might be your, your friends, your work friends, your neighbors, your family, whomever is your network. And use that to build a to-do list or a wish list. It also takes off the, the uh, in that moment when somebody is asked, can you come over this weekend? I'd really like uh, to get out for half an hour. Yeah. And then there's a little, there could be like a little bit of friction there. And you know, I feel bad saying I can't, but by putting it electronically out there for your group of family, friends, and or coworkers that who want to help and don't know how to help, putting out there electronically allows them that opportunity to then look at their calendar at their own leisure and see what's available. And then to sign up for a time or a task that will work for their uh, schedule. 
and then that makes it easier for me as the caregiver. Brenda, thank you so much for sharing that story. I think it's going to be very, very helpful. I know it's helpful for me as a caregiver because oftentimes, even as a long-term caregiver, I'm just a real, you know, a little reluctant to reach out to my sister and say, what can I do? Because I feel that I'm adding on to her task, right? Mm -hmm. Giving her something else to do. But one of the things I will suggest to her is that she keeps a, uh, perhaps an online list or task of things that needs to be done. Do you have any tips on how to care for or help to stave off loneliness and social isolation as a caregiver? Yeah, so one of my favorite ways that I, I oftentimes uh, share with the caregivers that um, I work with day to day, week to week, um, again, leaning into that simplicity. Oh. Um, when you go for a walk in the neighborhood, even go to your mailbox and if you're picking up your mail, if you see a neighbor, give a gentle wave. It works both ways. They may not know what your journey is, but we're humans and we instinctively, if somebody waves to you, I'm going to give a little wave back or a little nod back. And that, that little moment can add, and it can add a, a, a relief to what feels like a social isolation um, or is a social isolation situation. Those small little interactions um, can make a world of difference for somebody. So um, it can also be going to the grocery store and simply as you're walking in, you know, holding the door open for the person yeah. behind you. Um, that chance glance and eye contact, a gentle smile speaks worlds of, of you know, it, it exceeds words to just give a gentle smile to somebody. And so those little pieces will start to build up. Yeah, as we, as we always say, it's just the simple, simple things that really make, to make a difference. Uh, Brenda, what are some of the community resources that are available to caregivers in Massachusetts? Sure, my, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, so for Massachusetts, we have a wealth of resources for caregivers, really and truly. Um, I think that the, I can think of four ways for caregivers to start. The first would be um, checking in with your local council on aging or senior center. They have an outreach worker that knows their community and they that is their their job there and they make it their business to know their community mm -hmm. and so as they're filtering in they too i'm networking with them they're ne networking with me um and so that's again we that's where we've built our relationships where we can lean in and make referrals to one another about families who are in need of assistance or looking for more support another way would be so greater springfield senior services is an aging service access point um, in the Commonwealth, we are one of 25 aging service access points that cover all cities and towns and villages in Massachusetts. And we each have our own district um, or, or catchment. Um, but one of the ways, if you're not sure who your aging service access point is, um, that is uh, another way to connect to us would be to call Mass Options. So in Massachusetts, um, uh, Mass Options has a 1-800 number, and I can share that with you afterwards, um, for folks to call, and they will talk with a live representative who will be able to learn about what resources and supports they might be looking for, and then geographically, based on their zip code, um, connect them to the ASAP that's in their neck of the woods. Um, and finally, um, Mass 211. They have a wealth of resources and information in their database. And again, you talk with an individual who you can express what you might be looking for, and they will give you a phone number to connect you to a community resource, which oftentimes does lead back to uh, an aging service access point. You know, Brenda, I'm oftentimes feel so fortunate to be a backstater because there's so many resources in our state that is really helping um, caregivers and older adults age well. Uh, and because Mass Option is so important, before we forget, why don't you just share that 1-800 number? Sure. Uh, Mass Options is 1-800-243-4636. Oh, okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, let's hear from a caregiver who has spent time with our field reporter, Cassley Killiam. Cassley, whom do you have with us today? Thank you, Sandra. So with me today, I'm joined by Lexi Thorup, a nurse living in Boston, who's going to share her experience with caregiving. So Lexi, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. <laughs> 
So you bring two really important perspectives to the conversation on caregiving, both professional and personal. On one hand, you've worked as a, a caregiver, as a nurse, um, caring for patients each and every day as part of your job. And then on the other hand, you also took on the role of family caregiver for your dad. So tell us about both of those experiences. I feel incredibly privileged that I first had the experience of being a nurse before I became a family caregiver. I feel like I could not separate being a professional nurse from being a family caregiver. I was so lucky to have a tool belt filled with experiences of how to advocate for my dad, how to physically care for my dad, how to educate him on things that he needed to do as the patient. And on the other hand, now that he has passed and I'm back to only being a professional nurse full time, I can't separate being a family caregiver from being a professional caregiver. I feel like I want to care for my patients the way that I care for my dad because everybody deserves to have somebody look out for them in that way and advocate for them. So I feel so lucky that I was a professional nurse before I became a family caregiver. Absolutely. And so tell us, uh, what was it that happened that um, caused you to start caregiving in a family context as well? Yeah. So I uh, was a nurse here in Boston and my dad is in California. I'm originally a California girl. And my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2019. Uh, that was right about when COVID was about to start. So I stayed in Boston uh, while he was going through chemo. And eventually um, when he was about to get surgery, I moved out to California and cared for him. Um, until the day he passed away. I was his primary caregiver. Uh, I took him to appointments, took care of him physically, as I mentioned. And uh, that at that time, I was 27 and felt completely isolated from people my age and felt like I could barely take care of myself. And I was in this position of having another person completely depend on me. And it was an extremely intense experience. Wow, thank you for sharing that. I can only imagine, especially uprooting your life and moving across the country in that way. So I think a lot of times when people think of the word caregiver, they don't necessarily think of someone younger or think of a millennial. So what was it like being a millennial, being someone in your 20s? Um, which is typically a time we think of, of, you know, traveling and getting your professional footing and things like that. What was it like to have this responsibility while in that chapter of your life? It was extremely frustrating. I think a lot of people feel that and are scared to say it. Um, I felt angry that I was in this situation, not at my dad, of course, but just at life. Um, and in the same breath, I wouldn't change it for a thing. That was the most intimate and special time with my dad. And I would never give it back for anything. But what I learned as when I was in the midst of caregiving, I was introduced to a program called Archangels and it's providing support to unpaid caregivers. And something I learned through them was that actually one in four millennials are unpaid caregivers. And I wasn't the only one going through what I was going through and that isolation that I felt wasn't reality. I was a part of a bigger picture and a part of a bigger group of people that were going through similar situations as me. That's such an important message, I think, for caregivers of any age, that you're not alone in this experience and that the challenges and, and also the meaning and purpose that can come from it, kind of the both the benefits and, and the challenges are, are really real and, and experienced by all. So it sounds like this program was a source of support. Tell us more about that and kind of um, what that offered to you through that experience. Yeah, what I learned through talking with them is that unpaid caregivers are 10 times more likely than the general population to have suicidal ideation. 
the rates of depression and anxiety and substance use are also much higher than the general population. And also in the same breath, what I learned was that having just one person to connect with and get support from reduces depression rates by 40% in unpaid caregivers and reduces anxiety by 30%. And I found that experience to be true. Um, the moment I connected with them, I felt like I had a tribe behind me. I had people that knew what I was going through, had advice to give me, to listen to me, to vent to. And that really turned things around for me. Um, in the midst of caring for my dad, I had terrible depression, really bad anxiety, uh, was barely getting through. And having support not only made me a better caregiver because I was taken care of, it made me able to be present with my father, made me able to appreciate the times that we had together and get a lot of meaning out of a really trying time. And what, how did those, those interactions and that support, what form did that come in? Were you, were these interactions online, virtually? Were you meeting up with other caregivers in person? How did that look? I was speaking to someone on the phone that honestly, I didn't know. Um, I was connected through a mutual contact to Archangels and I had the privilege of speaking, um, with a few people there who, a couple of women who understood what I was going through and had gone through similar situations as well. What I wish I had done in hindsight is give the people in my life a little more credit, a little more opportunity to be there for me. I think any caregiver doesn't want to admit that they're frustrated or that they're angry or that they don't want to be doing what they're doing because does that make me look selfish? Does that make me look like I'm a bad person? But I think I wish I would have allowed the people in my life to be there for me. I wish I had opened up. I wish that I was more honest and gave them the opportunities to support me. Well, on that vein, what would you recommend to other caregivers who may be listening in and who are in a similar position where they're feeling really isolated and lonely and burned out and all of the things that you mentioned, um, how can they take steps to, to feel better and support themselves in this process as well? I think having, not everyone is blessed with people in their lives that can physically help out but I would look back on the people that were in your life before you became a caregiver. In the moment, it feels like you're the only one there. But in reality, there are people that love you before you were a caregiver, and they're going to love you now that you're a caregiver. And those people want to be there for you, and they want to support you. And so giving people the chance to, to say, look, I'm having a really hard time. Can we just talk on the phone or can we go get a coffee if you're able to leave the house or can you come over to the house? I think you'll be surprised how many people show up for you. That's fantastic. So I'm curious, Lexi, if you could enact one change here in Massachusetts or more broadly in American culture and society that would help better support caregivers, what would it be? As I mentioned before, I was so privileged to be a professional nurse before my dad got sick. And I took those skills with me as a caregiver. I know that that's not the experience for the general population. And people learn on the job. You learn how to do these challenging things in the moment. But I think when you become a caregiver, it is almost like a new chapter in your life in the same way as perhaps having a child, a new mother has new mothering classes. I feel like new caregiver classes would be so beneficial, learning how to advocate for your patients, what questions to ask doctors, 
uh, general medications that the patient might be on, how to change a patient while they're in bed, when they're soiled, how to clean somebody. You don't know how to do these things from the start. These are things that are learned. Um, so I think if I could do one thing, I would say that there should be government provided courses for brand new caregivers to learn the basics of how to be a caregiver, essentially. Fantastic. I love that. Very cool. <laughs> well, is there anything else you, you want to share, Alexi, about your experience or um, a message for other caregivers? Anything else that, that you'd like to impart to our viewers? Yeah, I think now that I'm two years out um, from, I'm not a caregiver anymore, family caregiver, uh, although everybody's probably a caregiver in one way or another, but I don't care for my dad anymore. I would tell people to even Google just what resources there are in your state for caregivers. I think the hardship of being an unpaid caregiver is coming to light. And I'm sure your state is probably supporting caregivers in one way or another. And so reach out to any resources you can find, take advantage of resources that there are, take advantage of home health aides, get yourself some rest, take advantage of people that want to help you and get outside of the house every once in a while, take care of yourself because ultimately you won't be in this situation forever. Um, unfortunately, when it's over, it probably means that your loved one is gone. But you, So you want to cherish those moments with the person that you're taking care of. Um, so I would say reach out to people, ask for help, allow people to help you and see what resources are available to you. Wonderful. Words of wisdom. I think one of the things that really stood out to me that you shared with us, Lexi, was that being supported and finding other caregivers as well as family members who you could lean on for support helped you not only get through the days more easily, but be more present with your dad and cherish those moments more. And so that's one takeaway that I hope uh, viewers will, will keep uh, following this conversation. So thank you so much for all the insights you shared. Of course. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Sandra, back over to you. Thank you, Kathleen. Brenda, before leaving, what is one closing thought you'd like to share with caregivers? They're not alone. Caregivers are not alone. There is a wealth of resources, not only in Massachusetts, but across the nation. AARP has a phenomenal website with a wealth of caregiving resources for folks yeah. to read, and their articles will then often lead them to those local community resources as well. Um, they're not alone and there are so many resources to help them. It's just a matter of a call and it's free to call. So call us. Oh, wonderful, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda, so much. Uh, and thank you all to our viewers tuned in. We hope you join us again next month for another episode of Connect. Until then, please visit inlonelinessma.com to watch past episodes of Connect and to learn more about the task force and ways that you can get involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm.